welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and this podcast is the second of three episodes in which ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin speaks with Scott Amix, managing partner at Scott Amix Ventures and author of the forthcoming book, The Human Race, How Humans Can Survive in the Robotic Age. Our first conversation with Scott covered his ideas about the future of the Internet of Things. Today, we discuss artificial intelligence and what it might mean for the global economy. I did want to come back to your question around, I think, the implication to humans and the fact that it's somewhat like a, kind of like an informed voter. And I remember in graduate school uh, learning about irrational voters and Eros theory and so forth. Uh, but the point is that you can say that a lot of voters are are non-participatory, but when in fact they are being actually rational, they're choosing to be rationally ignorant. And that is somewhat, uh, somewhat similar in the sense of the security is that they're choosing to not obtain the kind of necessary information to make um, prudent decisions. And the question is, is there going to be a behavioral change? Maybe, maybe not. Now, one of the things that I will share with you is that in the very near future, there is going to be an intermediary. And that intermediary is going to be a very advanced form of virtual assistant. So without getting into a long list of uh, Alexa and Viv and Siri and and uh, even X.AI and many of these other virtual assistants that's cropping up that's based on AI as well as human computation aspect, is that uh, because just the sheer number of intelligent edge nodes that we are going to be interacting with, we can't afford to interact with applications. So if the home has, let's say, 20 to several hundred devices, it just doesn't make any sense, nor do we want to control it with a remote per se. And there's a startup for that as well. So having an um, intermediary, an intelligent system at some point that can mature into something like a Jarvis in Iron Man is really where things are going to go is it's that intermediary that's going to negotiate on your behalf. It understands some core tenets or principles or preferences. And there are some things that you know brings to your escalation. But really, it's going to be handling all the, the handoff and, of course, uh, conjunction with DAOs and blockchain uh, transactional aspects. That is really, I think, where things are going to go, where we can have a degree of confidence that we may not be able to have 100% confidence or security around everything, but there is a filter, an intelligent filter, that's advocating and protecting us to an extent. So you're taking us, I guess, into um, into the world of artificial intelligence, robotics, and, and so on. And, and you've got a, a second book that you've written, which is coming out this year, I understand, called The Human Race, How Can Humans Survive in the Robotic Age? Um Tell us a little bit about the essence of AI and, and, and robotics that you're exploring in the book. That's a big topic. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let me, get, let me um, um, go back a few steps and give you a little bit of context. Um, is that because I speak and I am in many ways through the work that I do, I am propelling and pushing forward the adoption of deep technology and the convergence of exponential technologies, is that... Um, we are going to see incredible efficiency. Uh, so yesterday, as an example, I was t- talking with an investment arm of a holding group that represents about 1,300 restaurants across the world. And the ways that they can start to automate their value chain from the back office to the kitchen to the front and the customer interactions, as an example. So what we're going to see is a hyper adoption of things like RPAs, robotic process automation, and lower forms of niche AI, which is happening all over everything from CAT scans to any type of images. A lot of our startups are focused on you know, computer vision, as an example. Uh, with applications to autonomous vehicles and, and human predictive analytics. And you have uh, you know, research that's coming from MIT that has manifested into a startup that is focused on social physics, which is a predictive analysis of humans. So anything to do with humans, they can start to apply AI and have a degree of where things could go, which is uh, pretty powerful. And they've received the World Economic Forum Award recognition as well as uh, receiving grants and, and awards from DARPA so as an example. Um, The thing with AI is from a corporate or from an industry perspective, it is going to be very powerful. And there are, of course, a lot of issues around readiness, competency, centers of excellence, and and talent pool. So McKinsey, for example, has a sitting army of thousands, if not tens of thousands, of data scientists and analysts and AI that is ready to deploy to large engagements. And you have big shops like the IBMs and Google and Microsoft that has API services from Watson to 
to Google products, API services that you can use and, 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 and start to develop classifiers as an example. So all the fundamental building blocks are starting to become available. And as corporations start to uh, internalize these things and apply to their value chain, what we're going to start to see is the term that they're using is man and machine. Because it's very natural when I speak in, in a conference setting or when there is just you know, other keynote speakers and we're, they're talking about this topic, that the initial resistance, you can sense just that thickness of resistance in the air, mm-hmm. uh, even though the economics just are so compelling. But what's going to happen is as these organizations, including not just not just the traditional corporate entities, but also uh, decentralized, autonomous organizations based on blockchain. As they start to use more of these things, uh, their cost structure, their capex and opex are going to fundamentally change. And initially, it's going to be task replacement, not holistic job replacement. But if we do fast forward, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years, those niche AI capabilities will start to accumulate more skills. Mm -hmm. And in turn, we'll start to take away more and more of your task at some point, take a big chunk of a functional capability. And yes, there will be at that point potential significant uh, jeopardy of holistic jobs. And many people think that AI is going to be most um, detrimental to low-skill workers, and that is absolutely not true. There are many charts, many graphs, and many data and studies that show that from an ICT uh, plot charter, yes, they are highly susceptible. And cities like Las Vegas and other service-oriented cities are very likely to be, you know, 50% or more going to be displaced within the, within the next 10 years with, through automation and robotics. However, it's actually also the specialized uh, doctors and PhDs. It's the radiologists. It's people that have a very specific set of capability that tends to be quantitative or very technical mm. that can actually easily be replicated and displaced via automation and hyper uh, hyper automation and robotics. So the point of what I'm, what I'm getting at is that when we fast forward, again, not even getting to the topic of general AI or singularity, but in the next several decades, definitely in my lifetime, uh, somebody who's in his 40s, we're going to start to see uh, significant segments of the population that's going to be displaced. And, and let me just caveat that. There are going to be many people that's going to retrain and find new jobs that do not exist today. So, for example, Snapchat went public. And 10 years ago, we would have never thought that AI-based selfies and AR filters <laughs> would be a business model, let alone a job. But yeah. sure enough, it is. Uh, so there are going to be new jobs. There are going to be people that's going to be able to retrain themselves in a new workforce where it's going to amplify our capabilities. But there are people, and it's very easy. I mean, just think about your uncle, your aunt, your cousin, your brother, your sister, your spouse, your kids. There are people just within our inner circle that you know they're not going to be going back to school. They are not likely to retrain themselves. And what's going to happen to them? Mm -hmm. So my second uh, book on human currency is about how do we start to think about it proactively? If you leave it up to the government, even if they understand some of the premise and the concerns, Uh, the policy implications, the way they go about legislatively, nothing fruitful may come out post, decades later. By then, it will be too late. So the kinds of populism and nationalism that we're seeing, regardless of your political position, not just in the U.S., but, you know, throughout the world, I was uh, in London during the vote of Brexit, as an example, is very much sweeping across the globe. And we can expect that with hyper-automation and, and, and robotics, that that is going to accelerate at an incredible rate. And there are going to be politicians that's going to take advantage and exploit that segment that feels left out from the economic prosperity. Uh, so I'll just stop there and pause to ask if you have other questions before I go further into the book. Mm. I mean, you, you raise some very interesting points there, certainly around you know job training, the, the, the different opportunities that inevitably will, will arise. I, I know one of the other things that you you highlight in the book is this, um, the notion of the universal income, and you you go into that in some detail. Um, Perhaps you could talk a bit about that in relation to, uh, for people, I guess, who aren't able to retrain or or choose, make a very conscious effort not to retrain, because there will be some of those as well. Great question. Um, What I would say is that um, there is certainly merit if you compare it to the traditional welfare entitlement program. However, I think when you look at the different survey results and some of the studies that's come out, as well as just kind of basic common sense questions is that 
If you had the option of receiving $1,000 in the form of basic universal income versus $1,000 from a job with a potential upside, which one would you choose? And even if the job didn't necessarily have a huge upside, there is something innate about us as humans, where in a society, we feel that it's important for us to have a role and a position. Mm -hmm. And being productive is just human nature to what we do. And even if we're not part of the active labor force in the home or in other capacity, we are in nonprofits and so forth, we are productive. We want to be productive, and it gives us meaning and purpose. So receiving an entitlement is not the same as uh, doing something that's going to potentially propel you and give you other kinds of intrinsic as well as extrinsic rewards. So one of the models that I've been working through is something called the human currency. Uh, The last several years, uh, there's been a kind of a nagging concern in the back of my mind, which is I am at the forefront of pushing for a lot of these exponential technologies that could displaced a lot of people. Mm. And I couldn't quite reconcile how I can actually help address that externality. And I think just now it's starting to come to a point where it, it started to uh, take a bit of shape, so to speak. And what I realize is, and without going getting into a presentation that I built around this topic, is that when we think about an economic model uh, of goods and services, that model has been around, that paradigm has been around for since you know, time that we've moved from barter to fiat currency. However, I would argue that there is another economic parallel model that is very much active and vibrant, but does not have an efficient marketplace. So in other words, when you help a aging parents or when you help an aging uh, neighbor, or when you're helping out a nonprofit or a church or a different organization, are you not providing value? When you go to a a soup kitchen and serving the homeless, does that have no economic value? And and the list just goes on and on. And I would say that, and we've actually looked at the labor data sets, and one sector of the jobs that we see a growth, whereas everything else is in decline, uh, is under personal services, Mm -hmm. is that in, in the next 20, 30 years, when there is hyper-efficiency. Um, we don't need to be human computers, per se. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm against STEM. That's not what I'm saying. But we need to accentuate the areas that we do best. And fundamentally, that's about empathy. Yeah. Machines may try to tell you that they can detect primary, secondary emotions through very various multimodal capabilities. But the reality is to have empathy, you have to be in the position of human looking at another human being. So we need to focus on skill set and qualitative uh, capabilities that we can help other. It's it's being able to, it's the coaching. Mm -hmm. And I give the example of Oprah and Tony Robbins Mm -hmm. and the fact that they're billionaires. And yes, they have different products around productions and so forth. But really fundamentally what they're selling is uh, being happy, uh, loving yourself, or inspiring others. That's a kind of... Uh, sectors, economic sectors that I'm talking about. So the human currency starts to put a mechanism or scheme in place that starts to externalize the economic value of the personal services that we already do. For example, my wife is, I mean, she can be found at the church all throughout the week, just, you know, literally pouring 40 hours a week for free. But I would argue that there is actually opportunity cost and there's value for that. And without getting into too much of the detail, there is a way for us to construct this human currency paradigm that runs in parallel with the current monetary system and the current economic model. And in places like Detroit, Michigan, where we know there isn't going to be any type of economic investment uh, into that region, whereas when you go there, it it feels absolutely just uh, horrific and you just feel completely depressed because there is no economic vibrancy whatsoever. But I would argue that we can actually create economic activity and growth in that region through the human currency. The fact that they're helping each other, the fact that there's church members, the fact that people are giving each other rides or, or being a friend or playing basketball with each other is that as long as you're very explicit, it's a contract, meaning I'm going to come and help out a senior citizen um, center for 10 hours, and for that, I charge 50x currency, human currency, um, per hour. And they say, yeah, I, I would love that. Um, you know, my, my kids are in other states. I would love to have your company and just, you know, listen to my stories, as an example. So when that contract is in place, that person can actually earn extra money. And if they wanted to do that on a full-time basis, they can actually make a career out of it, as mm-hmm. an example.
Hmm. That's very interesting because you know, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself that you know we've we've been talking about this growth in technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, and, and yet what you've just been doing is highlighting that actually that raises a whole range of other opportunities that perhaps we wouldn't be able to take advantage of because we're so focused on on technology. That was the second part of our conversation with Scott Amix, managing partner at Scott Amix Ventures and author of the forthcoming book, The Human Race, How Humans Can Survive in the Robotic Age. We hope you enjoyed hearing his thoughts on AI and the role of humans following the fourth industrial revolution. Be sure to listen to our next episode, which will feature the third and final installment of our interview with Scott. We'll be getting a bit more personal with him, discussing healthy social media use and tech for kids. To find more resources and information on AI and what it can mean for your company, and to hear more conversations with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin, please visit securityforum.org.